Boxing, boxing fans. So uh, we're going to be doing a roundtable discussion tonight regarding the Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury rematch. Uh, I've got three guests with me tonight. Uh, they are Angelo from Manchester. He's done a bit of boxing himself. And like myself, he's a big boxing fan. Uh, and we met in Birmingham, didn't we, at um, Andrew Millwall's uh, charity boxing event? Yeah, that's correct. And also, that's where we met Tyson Fury as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. Good point. In fact, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to post my photo of that, actually, um, underneath the video. So, yeah, yeah we, we both met Tyson. And he gave us a sing-song as well, if you remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he said he said an idol rules and everything. Yeah, yeah, really great day. And uh, we're also joined by Ash Lane, who is a super bantamweight professional boxer. In fact, he won the Commonwealth title uh, a couple of years ago and lost it recently to Brad Foster. Hi, Ash. How are we doing? All right, mate. And uh, and Jeremiah um, Pricer, is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. You got yeah, it, man. Who is uh, from the Grueling Truth uh, podcast. If you haven't checked it out, you should do. It's a good website. And um, and uh, pod- what's the name of the podcast again? Sorry, it's okay. The show is called Inside Boxing Weekly. Okay. And uh, if you follow Jeremiah on um, Facebook or social media, you can check out his uh, stuff there. Um, so let's get straight to it. What we're going to do is um, uh, I'm going to ask four questions of both uh, of all the panelists. And one by one, we'll all answer our thoughts on the subject. So, uh, first of all, Angelo, uh, did you expect Tyson Fury to win? And if you did, did you expect him to win so convincingly? Um, Not really, because the way the first fight went, I thought that was Tyson Fury's last chance, basically. And um, I thought with Deontay Wilder catching him with them two knockdowns, it's an easy puzzle to, you know, you know, um, solve in the second fight. Surely you hurt him. You know how to get him, get him out of there early. But then as we was, we was going closer to the fight and closer to the fight, I was watching the Deontay Wilder in a press conference that wasn't shouting, bomb squad, every 10 minutes. I'm seeing the demeanour of this guy change. I'm looking at him thinking, is he trying to consume energy for the fight? What's going on with his demeanour? What's going on with his character? And then um, Tyson Fury was chilled as well. So, I couldn't work out what was going on here. The head games weren't there like the first the first fight. Um, then as it was drawing more to the weighing, I'm seeing Deontay Wilder, Wilder falling asleep on his misses. Looks like he doesn't want to be there. I'm seeing him actually at the weighing. And Deontay Wilder, yeah, he's only 15 stone, 15 and a half stone, man. But he's got bowling, bowling ball shoulders, a huge back, and he was lacking in them departments. And I said, where's his back gone? Where's his shoulders gone? Then I look at Tyson Fury on the way in. And when, once he tends them biceps, I've never seen muscle mass on that man like that before. He's not genetically gifted like that. When I said that, I said to everyone in my family, get money on a Tyson Fury knockout. Mm. So it, it took to that point in the way in to say, Fury's going to win this. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so near, nearer the fight, you did think that he would probably win by stoppage, but maybe not before before fight night yeah correct all right then okay and ash what are your views uh well i mean you know uh for for the last few weeks few a couple of months i've just um been telling everybody you know i thought wilder would not come out again you mm. know I, I thought he'd uh i thought he'd catch fury i thought he probably underestimated fury the first time around just so he was a big fat lump and he'd walk through him. I thought that um, after the first couple of rounds in the first fight, reality hit him. And um, he realised that Fury was a, a real danger. He got away lucky. And I didn't think he would um, let Fury off the hook this time. Um, so all the way through, I've been saying he was a, a Deontay Wilder knockout. And then Monday, last Monday, I uh, I watched the first fight again, mm. and it just completely changed my mind, you know. So throughout a fight week, I um I I was either you know I couldn't pick or 
I was saying a few other points to be honest. I couldn't see a knockout. Mm. Um because I thought it'd be too dangerous putting Wilder on the back foot, walking straight into that big one hand. Um but I just thought that the skill, the speed, the ring craft of Fury was just befuddle Wilder again. And I thought it cruised to an easy um points decision. But I did not see the uh, I did not see the stoppage coming. Mm-hmm. All right, then, mate. Okay. And Jeremiah, your thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, up until, you know, the way in itself, I was under the impression that Tyson Fury didn't need to do much else but box on the back foot, essentially do what he did in the first fight, but just be a bit sharper with it. I figured Fury was not at his best in the first go-round. He is not in the best shape he could have possibly been in. And, and again, I, I thought, to me, Tyson, you know, and, I, and I've been on record with this for years, you know, uh, especially my host Mike and I, you know, we never felt as if Deontay Wilder was malleable. We, you know, we just never thought much of his ring intelligence. So him being able to adapt, I, I was just highly skeptical of the prospect. Again, I was on record saying so. And so I wasn't, uh, I mean, the, you know, the prospect of Deontay Wilder catching him with one flush right hand and ending it was always in my mind. I think that's why, you know, Wilder seemingly became a, a, a betting favorite leading up to fight night. And then when he showed up at 231, looking Adonis like, you know, the biggest he's ever been, a lot of us were interested. But to me, the Deontay Wilder's weight indicated that he would not be at his best, even if he looked his best physically, because if you go back a few years, Deontay Wilder, when he was 228, 229, uh, in that three fight run with uh, Spilka, um, Duhapis, and Eric Molina, to me, that was his worst period of time. But to me, I was thinking that Tyson Fury would come in lighter. He'd be quicker on his toes. He'd stick behind the jab and earn a wide points verdict. But once he came in at 273, I, I was sure that he was going to be more physical, but I was unprepared as to how physical he actually was. And credit to him because in the pre-fight buildup, he was saying that he was going to go after him. He was going to be physical, and he did just that. I was hoping beforehand that he would do maybe something like old, you know, George Foreman, where he would stick behind the jab, push him around, back him up, bang him. But I thought it was going to be a mixture of the two. I thought he would, jab, you know, box a bit, get physical a bit, and that would be his game plan. But the fact that he came forward – and got it done, surprised the hell out of me, and obviously surprised the hell out of a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. That Those are my thoughts. I, I thought that uh, knowing nothing about, you know, how boxers train and how they get weight ready and whatnot, and obviously with heavyweights not having to actually make weight, but obviously weight is still a factor in their, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, pre-fight game plan. Uh, I thought that like Jeremiah said, that he would go in and he would do the same as he did before, which was box smart, etc. But maybe um, put a bit more pack into his punches. Maybe that's what his trainer, his new trainer, uh, had told him to do. And what it looks like is that when he said he was going to do this and do that, you know, knock him out, etc. Um, I thought that was just pre-fight, you know, talking. But maybe actual fact, that is what they'd worked on. And that is why he put on the extra muscle, which presumably means uh, or extra weight, which presumably means more muscle. And also one of the other reasons why the big fighters apparently put on the weight is to, um, to sort of uh, drain their opponents by leaning on them. I remember when Danny Williams fought Vitaly Klitschko, he came in at a career high, whatever it was, about 20 stone or 19, 20 stone. And they said he was going to lean on him all night and this, that and the other. And of course, that didn't happen. Um, so, so yeah. So weighing in that much, I thought, well, I don't really understand why he's done that. But it turns out that it probably was because of what Tyson Fury said he was going to do, which is um, apply more pressure, be more you know, vicious and spiteful with his punches. And that's precisely what he did. But yeah, but prior to the fight, I thought he would win a points decision like he possibly did in the first one, but didn't get the verdict. 
Um, but I thought that he would get the verdict this time because instead of, you know, taking a few rounds out or, you know, pitter pat pitter patter jabbing this round or that round, instead of doing that, he would, um, you know, put more pressure on the, his punches and this time, you know, win, you know, unanimously. Um, so does anyone want to add anything to that? Uh, well, uh, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll we'll move on to the next one then. So, um, so do you think the fight was stopped at the right time, or do you think it maybe even could have been stopped earlier, or shouldn't have been stopped at all at that point? So, uh, Angelo, sorry, Ryan. Sorry, Ryan. That's to me. Um, give me a second because someone's ringing me on WhatsApp, so I'm going to install it. Um, all right, we'll, go, we'll move on to Ash then. We'll come back to you. Yeah, okay. Um, to be honest, dog, my, my first instincts, my first thoughts from watching the fight and um, it was stopped was, you know, I mean, it was too early. Mm. But I, I've watched the fight a couple of times. It's, it's a really tough one because as a fighter, you know, you want to go out in your shield. Um, you know, you if you get knocked down, that's the only way you'll lose is because you can't get up, you know. Um, so, I mean, personally speaking, like, I'm sitting here for my shoes, if I was John to Wilder, it'd be like, it was too early. Mm. But, like I said, watching it back, you've got the blood coming out of his ear. Um, he was on really, really unsteady legs for a couple rounds. Mm. And he was completely gassed. He had no energy. His balance was all over the place. Um, it wasn't hitting Fury. It was it, it was being demolished, mm-hmm. and it was only a mat- matter of time before he was um he was seriously hurt. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I mean, it could have been stopped a bit earlier. It took more punishment, but at the time it was stopped. He was in the corner. He was taking some decent right hand. It didn't look like they were concussive, but they were decent shots. So I mean, you've got to say. You know, you got to look after the boxer's health. Mm. And overall, think about it, it probably was a good, good, um, good, good stoppage. Yeah. All right, then. And that's that's from a professional boxer. So I'm sure, you know, um, you would have you wouldn't have felt very good being pulled out at that point. No, no, no. I um, no, if I wasn't done to Wilder's shoes or if that if that was just me in those shoes and I was pulled out the fight. Mm. Um, and I was still on my toes. I was devastated. I mean, it happened to me in my fight against Brad Foster. Mm. Only about 10 seconds to go, I was stopped to my feet. Mm. And, I mean, um, to be honest, I don't remember much of what happened in that last round. But mm. to be stopped to my feet when I was trying to fight back, mm. I was absolutely gutted. So I know how uh, Deontay Wilder would feel. Okay. All right, mate. And uh, Jeremiah? Jeremiah? Oh, hello. Sorry. Missed missed the uh, the, the mute button there. But, uh, I mean, I pretty much agree with everything Ash said. I mean, he was pretty spot on. I think Mark Breland was looking at it from a a, a personal standpoint, you know, he's had a long relationship with Deontay Wilder. Uh, oddly enough, the other trainer, uh, I believe his name was Diaz, yeah. you know, disagreed with Breland and essentially threw him under the bus there. But mm. I, I think Breland saw exactly what we saw, that Wilder mm. was taking uh, sustained damage, you know, and after watching Deontay Wilder, you, you know, blitz so many guys for years, you know, and, and him himself being a boxer, I mean, Braylon was an excellent amateur. Actually, mm. you would think if anybody would be a good trainer for Deontay Wilder, it would be Breland because he was tall for his his size. He was, uh, you know, a technically great amateur. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, obviously it hasn't translated for one reason or, or another. But, yeah, I mean, after watching Deontay Wilder blitz guy after guy, and then you see him take that, you know, sustained damage – yeah, it's a big red flag, and I think he did the right thing. And to be, uh, from what I've seen, the the overwhelming majority of people seem to think that that was the right thing to do. I did see some detractors initially on Twitter and other places 
but that seems almost unanimously to be the right thing. And, you know, Ash talked about the damage that Deontay Wilder was taking, uh, you know, not not only physically, but, you know, part of me was thinking about internally, too, because he took some ferocious body punches as well. So I imagine, you know, maybe his ribs or his stomach is going to be sore as well. Um, but it was it was absolutely the right call. Uh, and, you know, the thing about it as well is is that uh, Wilder, he protested a little bit after the stoppage, you know, asking Breland why, why he do that. And to me, even the protest seemed a bit half-hearted, where he, he had to have known that the end was near. It was, it was just a good stoppage. Also, I noticed with Wilder at the end of the fight, when he gave his post-fight um, interview, he seemed a bit incoherent, almost as though like he might have had c- concussion or something. Yeah. He looked he looked really bad shape. And um, when a boxer's in that state, I don't really think they should be doing post fight interviews. I think they should let them just go go on. I mean, it's yeah. it's not as if it's needed. Um, are you back now, Angelo? I'm back. Yeah, but can you yes. just give me the question out again, Ryan, mate? Yeah, so do you think the fight was stopped at the right time or should it have been stopped earlier or not at all? Um, it was a strange one, really, because I was saying stop it from about round three up to about round five, six. So I think that Kenny Bayliss did every, everything in his power to allow Deontay Wilder to survive. And um, even though he was taking the punches and the punishment he was taking, it, taking you would have to think that Tyson Fury might slow down at some point. Deontay Wilder might hit him with one of them bombs and turn the fight on its head. Now, that's the only reason he was left in the ring that long, because he had that one-punch power that could have turned the fight on, it, uh, on its uh, turned it on its tables or whatever you want to call it. And for me, I thought the referee stopped the fight because I didn't see the towel get thrown in. So I said, that's a good decision. So... To, to find out it was the corner who threw the towel in, that, for me, was saying Kenny Bayless was even saving him more. Because I would, you know, he didn't stop the fight then. So, so uh, 100% that fight needed stopping. We're talking about someone's health. We've seen the box, boxers recently die. Imagine another boxer died. That'd be three deaths recently. They'd be calling for bans of the sport, mm. things like that. And at the end of the day, he gets to live, see you another day, and if he wants to come back and settle the score, he can do it. So I think whoever threw that towel in, that was brave. That was braver because his his main coach didn't throw it in. I think it was someone else he had in the corner who threw it, it in. Mark Freeland, yeah, yeah, one of his Yeah, one of his cornermen. So I think he owes him a lot. End of the day, we've all we're all fighters. So when you say he was still fighting on the instinct, he maybe he maybe was, but was he with fighting with his equal, equal, I can't say it, equilibrium with mm. his balance. No, he wasn't. He wasn't fighting with his balance since his ear was bleeding. Where do we know that bleeding's coming from? Is it coming from the ear? Is it coming internally? Is it coming from the brain? He's mm. spitting blood out. What more do you want to see? It wasn't an entertaining fight. It was only entertaining because Tyson Fury was destroying him. Mm. So, yeah, he, he had nothing to offer. And, and, and I didn't see the wild or of old. Wilder is called Windmill Wilder. He swing po- punches like he's an helicopter. You never seen none of that. So mm. for me, he didn't have that in his artillery. And I thought, where's this? Where's this wonder punch coming from? I don't see it. I, I've never seen it coming all night. So I think the referee did a great job. You could have left uh, Deontay Wilder in there all night. He still wouldn't have landed that one shot. It was a great. It was a great call for the towel. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the referee's got a difficult job because um, he can't stop it too soon because, you know, they're professional boxers. It's their job. Um, He can't stop it too soon because it's a world title fight and the champion is the one who's getting brutalised in the first place. So he's got to sort of sum that up. Uh, I think it looked like he was um, on the verge of stopping the fight anyway before the towel came in because at least according to the video shots, like the video angles, um, the towel sort of comes in almost parallel to um, Bayliss. So he might not have even seen it at the time. I mean, I don't know. I can't remember if I saw a video angle of him actually seeing it, but it looked like he was ready to stop it anyway. So, yeah, I think it was the the correct stoppage. And uh, and also, 
um, because he's got that one punch power, which I think has been blown up a terrible amount, you know, all well throughout the entire day, throughout the entire, you know, um, pre fight build up. We've been told that Deontay Wilder has got the heaviest punch in boxing. And some people have said, you know, he's got the hardest punch in history and whatnot. Yeah, right. Which, of course, um, is is aimed at people, you know, to buy the pay-per-view. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but when you do have power like that, that's, you know, one of the reasons they might leave you in there. Uh, I, I Like, I remember when Paulie Malinaji lost to, I think it was Ricky Hatton, and um, when the uh, the ref pulled him out, or the the doctor, I think pulled him out. The doctor, I'm sure, said something like, "No, you can't win," because he couldn't he couldn't knock Ricky Hatton out because he didn't have punch punching mm-hmm. power like that. Um, and of course, he didn't want to leave, but they forced him to. And um, another one who, who who left the ring like that uh, was uh, Wayne McCulloch in his uh, rematch with Oscar Larios. He just got punched around the ring for. I think it was 10 rounds when they stopped it, 10, something like that. And uh, the doctor pulled him out and he was begging uh, not to stop it. Um, so, yeah, it was the right stoppage. But I, I can understand why the ref would let it go on or, you know, whatnot, because, um, you know, this is boxing after all. Um, does anyone want to add anything? Yeah, I, I would ask real quick what you fellas thought of Kenny Bayless's performance leading up to the stoppage. Did you think, to me, he seemed a bit intrusive. I, I don't know what you fellas think. Shall I go first? Yeah, yeah, Angela, yeah. Um, I, I was quite disappointed. I thought it was a bit of a job Cortez going on against Ricky Hatton. Now, the only good thing Tyson Fiori did is when he was clinching, um, Deontay Wilder, he was clinching him on the blind side of the referee and he did very well um, I think he was spoiling the fight a lot, he, he picked up the, the, let's talk about the, the first knockdown, where did he pick that knockdown up at, seven seconds in and then he counted time uh, six on his fingers from the timekeeper but he gave him seven seconds to get to his feet before he done the count so I, I was very disappointed with this referee like I say I think he was there to try and make Deontay Wilder survive. Should it go to points, he was going to get the win. Controversy again. And I was quite disappointed in him. Um, but Tyson Fury must have gone in there with a plan. Listen, I boxed the head off Deontay Wilder last time, didn't win. I ain't, get, I ain't fooling the referee and I ain't fooling three judges. And that's the reason why he went in for the knockout. So then you can't take it away from him, can you, really? Mm-hmm. And Ash? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with everything that Angela just said. Um, I think that uh, Kenny Bailey was pretty poor, you know. He, um, I mean, the idea was letting Fury uh, lean on John Cena Wilder and put his head down. Um, you know, I mean, I think taking the point away was bad. There was no need to take that point away. Um, and I think he did that purely to give John Cena Wilder you know, a bit of recuperation, a bit of rest. Um, but all they do is just prolong the damage and prolong the fight. Um, but, yeah, you know, in my eyes, I, I think um, some of what Kenny Bailey's did was pretty biased. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it was letting Fury mold and, um, you know, drag around Deontay Wilder, um, you know, so it's a bit of fifty-fifty, really. Yeah, I, I, I don't think um, I maybe had a bit of an off night, but I don't. I think in any high-profile fight like this, don't forget this is you know probably the biggest fight of the year, unless Fury Joshua is made. In fact, this one might even be bigger than that because it was an international fight between an American and a Brit. Um, so I think you're gonna get some level of controversy because. The referee knows he's in the spotlight. He's got to have his A game on. He knows that, you know, millions of viewers are on him. So there's probably quite a lot of pressure on the referee. So he might he might not have been, you know, fully not prepared because he's had, you know, probably hundreds of fights like that. But, he, you know, he might have been a little bit anxious on the night. Uh, and also, I don't know how these things work, but I would imagine that referees are told prior to the fight, you know, give him benefit the doubt, you know, they're being paid tens of millions of dollars here. 
you know, the, these are big boys, they're world champions, so don't just stop the fight after round one, you know. So I would imagine that he's got a lot of pressure on his on him. Uh, but like uh, Ash just said, Fury was allowed to do a lot of stuff. You know, he was allowed to get on top of him. He was clinching, punching him, you know, uh, in the clinch and whatnot, which a lot of referees will try to, you know, stop before it begins. But yeah, I hate point deductions like that. Um, unless they've been given several warnings. And I don't think Fury was warned even once before that. And you do see that some sometimes you'll see a referee give a warning, you know, every other round and then maybe take a point off in round 12 or something, which seems a bit pointless. Uh, and then other times you see a referee just immediately take away like two points with no warnings at all. So, yeah, I, I don't like the latter. I think you should give several warnings. So, yeah, apart, apart from the point deduction, I didn't really see any problem. Um, so shall we move on to the next one? Yep. Um, so uh, what do you expect them both to do now? So, uh, you know, what do you think Wilder will do next now that he's coming off of a, a brutal loss? And what do you think um, Fury does next now that what, what is I think he's got two two fights left of his contract that he signed with. What was it? ESPN he signed with? I'm not entirely sure. Um, so anyway, let, let's go to Angelo first. Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. I've had this discussion with a few people now. Deontay Wilder's 34 years old. You can't you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't go from being 34, used to play chess in school and be the chess champion, not play it for 10 years, and say, come on then, let's go and do some grandmaster chess competitions. doesn't work like that. Same with boxing. So what are they going to do with Deontay Wilder? Because the blueprint to beat him is there. You stand centre of the ring. You don't let him bully you. Um, you don't stay there too long. You get out of range. You don't let him cock that hand. That he always look at the position he's in. He always cocks that hand before he throws it. He's not telegraphing the punch, but he might as well there because it's like his guns loaded and he's just ready to launch. D decent boxers won't get clipped. The only reason Tyson Fury got clipped in the first fight is because he was doing silly stuff. Um, but going back to the point, he's 34 years of age now. Where does he go? His legs are terribly skinny. Now, I suffer myself genetically with my calves. That's my dad's fault. I've tried to train him, can't put muscle on the calves. But I can put muscle on my quads. I'm a 12-stone man, and my quads are massive compared to Deontay Wilder's. So he'd have to look at his strength training, not just his boxing training. He'd have to get some bodybuilders in to build that strength in the quads. Because end of the day, you're getting hit off 19 stone men, 20 stone men on the chin. You know, you got to have a strong pair of legs. Um, and I question his training to this fight. Did he even do any neck training? When he was eating jabs, it felt like Riddy Bow was hitting him, not Tyson Fury. So I, I think he has to go to the drawing board. He's training, not only his boxing training, boxing IQ, but his strength training needs to You ain't going to get this in a year's time. So what do you do then? Do you, you, do you do what Ricky Atten did when he got beat off? Was it Pacquiao fight to no, no, two fights that you never heard of and get beat off? Or, or, or do you just retire or do you just take a big fight on and see if you, if you made a steal, see if you can come back? There's only a few options at this age. There's only a few options at this time. These fights aren't going to last forever. These big money fights are here. So he's not left with many decisions. And other than that, he's retired. Mm, OK. Uh, Ash? Yeah. Um, Wilder, like, yes, I mean, you know, like, say, he's over in his 30s, he's um, had 40-odd fights. It, it's tough to say where he goes from here because mentally he must be the, absolutely destroyed. You know, and um, anything in sport, your performance is based 70% on your um, mindset, is based on your uh, psychological welfare. So, um, you know, being absolutely destroyed like that, I don't know where it can go for me. I mean, it's not like the Joshua fight. When Joshua um, lost to Ruiz, he was winning the rounds up to the first knockdown. And then, you know, he never recovered from that one punch. 
So he had some positives to take from the fight in, in the fact that he knows if he doesn't get caught um, by Ruiz and he keeps on his toes and boxes long, he could win that fight. Whereas with Deontay Wilder, he didn't win a second of the, the second fight with Fury. The first fight he was meant to have lost. The second fight he did lose and he lost very bad. Mentally, he's got nowhere to go. Um, you know, if, if he was younger, say in his 20s, he could come back and build himself up. But, I mean, being, what do you say, 34, he's fought all the tomato cans that there are out there, you know. I mean, he's got no more, no more people. You know, he can't build himself back up, really. Um, all he can do is just jump in against, say, a Dillian White and um, try and get himself back in title contention. I think that having a rematch with Fury is a bad idea. I think Fury would just walk through him again because now the blueprint is there. Um, and I think, you know, Fury's in his mind. So, you know, for Deontay Wilder, I've got, you know, in my eyes, he should either come back with a fight against Adelian White or, you know, um, somebody that's not quite at the elite level to see if he can get himself a decent win and back in title contention mm-hmm. or call it a day. All right, then. And uh, Jeremiah? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any other option besides retirement and going into a third Fury fight. Now, personally, I don't want to see a third fight. Uh, As has been noted, the blueprint is already there. I don't think there's much Wilder can do to improve upon his performance. I think he just is what he is. Uh, But when you look, when you break it all down, it's, it's like, do you risk Wilder losing to somebody lesser or do you just take the third Fury fight and know that you're going to get a lot of money doing so? And then, you you know, win or lose, likely a, a loss, obviously. Uh, you, you just retire and set off into the sunset. I mean, it, to me, it just makes more financial sense, which is why, you know, his manager, Shelly Finkel, uh, and I even think one of his trainers have already said that they're going to do the third fight. And I know in the contract, it's like uh, roughly around August. I guess they can negotiate and put it back if they want to. But it just makes sense. As much as I don't like it as a fan, and I, you know, I'm an American, but I, I don't want to see it. I want to see uh, Fury versus Joshua so we can have more clarity in the division, you know, because it's been, you know, what, half a decade almost that we've been asking, well, who's the number one guy in the division? I think quite clearly it's Fury right now, but seeing as Joshua redeemed himself, there's still a bit, you know, a cloud of doubt surrounding it. So I want to see that fight, but if, if you're Deontay Wilder and you're Shelly Finkel, it just makes too much sense financially not to just go straight into a third fight. Because, again, you're, you're risking Deontay Wilder losing to somebody else. I mean, if he were to fight somebody like Dillian White, for instance, he could get bludgeoned. I mean, he could lose by knockout. And then what happens to that Fury payday? It's no longer. So to me, it just makes too much sense to go into it. I, I, again, I'm from a fan's perspective. I, I want to see the big fights now, you know, like Eddie Hearn was on uh, Facebook. He said, let's make uh, Fury versus Joshua in the summer. You know, I, I, I would love that. But I, I think we even realize that with all the politics involved, that fight is probably not going to happen until next year, maybe the spring, maybe the summer. And another thing, too, is Wilder, he, he has wonderful power. You know, to me, he's not one of the greatest punchers of all time at heavyweight. Obviously, he can crack. I mean, in you know, I said before the fight, you know, one of these days it's going to bite him in the ass. I mean, you can't keep going to the well in a sport like boxing and, and expect to get by with it over and over again. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a guy like Sergei Kovalev who came up through the Russian amateur ranks, has a real solid technical foundation under him to where even when he's losing, even when he's obviously on the downside of his career, he can just boil it down to the fundamentals and his punching power is good enough to get guys respect like you saw against anthony yard right he just boiled it down stuck behind the ones stuck behind the one twos and and got it done wilder is not like that his footwork is poor his timing 
is is okay, but there's just too many flaws there. And not only that, everything is going to be an uphill battle, a, a bigger battle from here on out, even if he gets close, even if he exhibits like some sort of Amir Khan mentality where knockouts don't really throw him off. It's going to, it's going to be an uphill battle here, from here on out because the blueprint is there. So everybody's going to be emboldened when they fight him next. So, you know, again, to answer the question, I think he goes into the third Fury fight. I don't really need to see it, but I think that's what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So with regards to Deontay Wilder, um, I think that um, 34 isn't too old because, um, you know, we see fighters all the time now fighting well into their late 30s. So I still think he's got years in him if he wants to continue. But after taking such a brutal, vicious, you know, loss, uh, like you've all said, um, what does he do next? So does he just try to bow out with a massive payday? which is what I think his team, like you've all said, will try to do, get a third fight with Fury. In Fury's camp, I don't see why they would bother, aside from the money. Uh, but from a fan's perspective, I hope they don't, because it'll just be another knockout victory, maybe even sooner this time. Uh, like you've all said, Wilder is a one-trick pony. Now, ironically, I think he has improved over time. I think he has got better, uh, even though... He's just come off this massive, brutal loss. But I think that was Fury improving even more so. Uh, but Wilder has improved because just even just a half a dozen fights ago, I mean, he was even more awful than he is, uh, than he is now. Uh, but that power is legitimate. And he, he did, you know, knock out Luis Ortiz twice. He did, um, you know, floor Tyson Fury twice. Uh, so it, it's not as if he's, he's fought absolutely nobody he has fought the best of the rest uh but of course in most divisions you see fighters fighting the best uh and at heavyweight we've only had that once now with fury and wilder we still need to see fury joshua uh you know joshua wilder whatever but yeah but i also think wilder can beat a lot of the other top guys so i think he beats andy ruiz probably i think andrew ruiz is just uh, too small and probably too susceptible to being hit. I think Wilder even potentially beats Dillian White because Dillian White has no movement. He doesn't move his head. He takes a lot of shots. So I think he could lose there. Uh, but I, uh, he might even beat Alexander Povetkin because Povetkin really is at the end of you know his career. I mean, he's 40. Uh, and then there's a couple of others he might still beat, like Derek Chisora and all that. But I think more to the point is, do you really want to continue if you've just been wbc champion for several years do you really want to continue beating the likes of you know ruiz who was a one night wonder a, an ancient pivot kid whatever and you know why would you why why not just take your you know 50 million dollars whatever and retire so so yeah with with Ooh. wilder i think his career now just boils down to getting a fight with either joshua or fury and I don't think Joshua is going to bother with that, you know, his team, because they can make more money with Fury. Uh, so, yeah, so Wilder's career is at a, a bit of a crossroads. Um, and, and and what do you guys think of Fury? Because I, I don't think any of you really touched on that. So, Angelo, where does Fury go? Well, before I touch on that, I was just thinking, I wanted to just, just have my last say on it. What you've got to remember there as well is look at all fighters, all unbeaten fighters that were world champions, they were never the same again. Prince Nazim Hamad, Ricky Hatton, Mike Tyson, you know, that's just to name a few. They're, they're never the same. There's something that just goes from him. Once you've been beaten, you lose something like that. And that's for any man. That's a man in the street who had 10 wins on the street. If he gets beat by a better man, he loses something. So, again, I think, he, you know, he's got to look at that. He's he's gone he's done so well, but now he's lost a fight. He's lost a bit of him. Can, can he can can he go back in the trenches? Has he got that in him to come back? I don't think he has. I don't think he has that demeanor. He doesn't have the scare tactics he has. And I don't know if people have got into his head and said stop clowning around, shouting bone squad. Because to be honest, I think that kept his energies up, his spirits up. And I noticed in his last two fights, he stopped doing that. Not even with his Tyson Fury fight. Well, the other one before it, he was just placid, calm. Mm. So I think he's untuned something that 
made him win. A bit like Prince Nazim's backflip over the rope. Mm. Why all of a sudden did he stop the backflip when he fought Barrero? Mm. It's like they know. I don't know. You see these signs. I know it's strange, but you see these signs. So in, in regards to the question, did you say where do I see Tyson Fury going? Yeah, yeah. So what, what happens with Fury now? Well, all all roads lead to Fiore. It's as simple as that. There's no more 60-40 splits. There's no more. Eddie Hearn is now doing a lot of YouTube boxing matches. What does that suggest? His cash cow isn't the cash cow anymore. Tyson Fiore is. But when you put them both together, they need each other. And this is it. This, this is the clash of the Titans. This is what's going to bring the money. And then you're going to have a rematch there as well. So this is what, I don't know what it, what it would scale in pay-per-view, but it's a massive fight. And at, at this moment in time, as a business sense, it makes perfect sense to sign a contract. But I wouldn't do it unless it was a 50-50 split. I wouldn't be taking those 60-40 because Anthony Joshua is more of a household name or whatever. For me, Tyson Fury has been the household name for the last three years. Coming back from depression, coming back from mental illness, you know, all of a drug addiction. And when Wilder was saying, oh, he's just he's just looking for sympathy, he's attention-seeking, everyone has a bit of mental health, no matter what sport you're in or what life you live. So to come back from that and catapult himself into the first match, and then he had a bit of a blip. You could see that against Schwartz. He had a blip. He looked in terrible condition. His mind went on the job. I think a fight before that, he was looking in the ring, more interested about in a fight in the ring, outside the ring, than in the ring he's, he's fighting, things like that. So you've got what you've got to always question about Tyson Fury is his mentality, his will to win. Is he going to go back and do what he done once he beat Klitschko? He's done it now. Where does he go? Who else can he win? Unless that desire is still in his heart where he wants to rip Anthony Joshua apart, and I think it is. So mm. I think... Next fight, Anthony jo- Joshua and Tyson Fiore. Yeah, mm. I think that's where it goes. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Ash? Um, for Fury, I think... Uh, I don't think the uh, Joshua fight will happen next. I think Joshua will fight his mandatory, which is Pulev. Mm. I think that'll be the first fight that will happen for Joshua. And... Fury, I think he'll try and skip past Dillian White. Um, I I don't know. I I can I can see Deontay Wilder, um, bringing the rematch clause in. Mm. I can see it, but so I, I'd probably say that'd be his next fight. Although I'd rather it was somebody else. I'd rather it was the Joshua fight. Um, I mean, to be honest. To make the choice for it, it's got to be 50-50. Like Angela said, um, I, I, I'm, Joshua isn't a bigger name than Fury. Not with all the mental health and everything that's happened and gone on. Um, you know, Fury is a bigger name now. He's a more household name. Um, he's, he's a bigger draw than Joshua. So, I mean, if anything, it should be 60-40 in Fury's favour. Mm. You know? Um, but that that's the fight which should happen next. It won't happen next. I don't think it will happen to at least next year, mm. personally. Um, I think Joshua will be fighting Pulev next. And I think Fury will have a rematch with Deontay Wilder again. Although I'd rather not see that. Yeah, you know, I mean the last fight it looked like it looked like a boxer against a white collar. Mm. It it was it was dreadful. You know, Deontay Wilder's his boxing skills is absolutely dreadful. It puts all of us professional boxers to shame. Mm. All right, then. And uh, Jeremiah? Yeah, no, as I, as I noted, I think that the third theory next, again, I'm like you guys. I, I don't want to see that fight. I think, like, maybe possible Wow is a bit slicker in the third fight, and he, like, Last a little bit longer, I think it was kind of a case of like, uh, what was it, Joe Frazier's rematch with George Foreman? Like, he gave him a few more angles, a bit tougher to hit. Because, you know, Foreman just had his number, and I think it's the same thing. Jeremiah, your uh, your audio is breaking up a little bit. Okay, me now. Uh, try talk again. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, now, now, yeah, that's good. Okay, sorry, I had to switch out Wi-Fi connections there. This one's a bit poor, so I apologize. But yeah, I, I think I think maybe Wilder can last a little bit longer. You know, maybe a bit like Frazier did with Foreman rematch, where he, he gave him a few more angles. He was a bit sharper, but ultimately it didn't matter because stylistically, Foreman just had Frazier's number. I think that's the case here. I think Wild Fury is just the better fighter, and so I think we're going to get the third fight. And then we may get a fight early next spring, maybe, and then we'll get the big Joshua showdown. I'm hoping that's how it plays out. And I can tell you as an American, I was rooting for Fury because he is a better crossover star than Deontay Wilder is. He's, he's better spoken, his, his image, his persona. It's more relatable to the common man here. And so I'm happy with the victory. And so I just want to see the Joshua fight happen that's the biggest fight that can be made right now. Let's get it done, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, that, yeah, Fury versus Joshua definitely doesn't happen next. I mean, first of all, Joshua's got to face Kubrat Pulev, is mandatory, which I think is in, I don't know, something like June or something. So is it is that right? June, I think it's in the summer. So, so yeah. he's got to face him. Fury... Uh, will then need to fight somebody in the summer. So who knows? So maybe it, it might be good to see him fight somebody like Dillian White, who who has been on the WBC's list for ages. Uh, you know, as a potential mandatory. In fact, I think he's been mandatory for like two years or something. <clears throat> so maybe somebody like that, uh, or chances are he'll just fight somebody who's not a big name. You know, like in in Fury's last two fights before the Wilder fight. Um, and then maybe we get the Joshua fight next year. Uh, I mean, for all Hearn's talk of let's get it made and all that, we know it's not going to be done as quickly as that. We know how Eddie Hearn works. Uh, I'm also not happy if it goes to Saudi Arabia, which it probably will, because Hearn said money talks, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, money talks, fans don't talk, you know, it's just money. Um, so that, that would be a shame if, if it takes place over there. Um, but yeah, but in, ter with, in terms of Fury's career, I don't think he'll fight more than the two fights which are left on his contract. And I wouldn't blame him. I mean, he's, he dethroned Vladimir Klitschko in what was, a, you know, a very good performance away. Uh, he, he beat Wilder, arguably, in their first fight, which was a good performance minus the knockdowns. Uh, he rematched Wilder and beat him, you know, to a pulp. Um, and if he can beat Joshua, well, that's the three best heavyweights of their era by a mile. It, you know, uh, um, you know, after the Vladimir Klitschko era. So, I mean, who else can he fight? I mean, he could beat somebody like um, or Luis Ortiz, but what would be the point in that? He could beat. Oh, oh he's also beaten Derek Chisora twice. Um, so. Fury doesn't really have anybody else to fight other than Joshua and maybe Dillian White. Give you know, if those were his two last fights, I think that would be a brilliant end of his career and whatnot. And yeah, and just going back to Wilder, <clears throat> um, he I think he could beat several fighters still out there, and he might even be able to beat Anthony Joshua still. But now that we've seen how how badly Wilder can be beat, I would probably favour. Um, Joshua to win that one, which leads me to my final question, which is, uh, does the Joshua Wilder fight still interest you? Because obviously before this fight, fans probably would have preferred to see Wilder versus Joshua. So, Angelo, does that fight still interest you? No, it would have it would have before this fight, uh, because when we was weighing up, me and my brother was weighing up Tyson Fiore, Anthony Joshua, Wilder, and we said the best concussive puncher out of him is Wilder. The best combination puncher and the uppercuts is Anthony Joshua. And the best stylistic boxer is Fiore. So then we were was, we was seeing who, who, who'd win who and, and we, couldn't, we couldn't make our minds up. But what we've seen now, we, we can clearly make that up. I wouldn't like to, to see him fight. So I think it would be a pretty cager at this moment in time because of, of the backlash he's had in his last fight. And what happened with Andy Ruiz? I think the first few rounds would be cagey as hell. They'd be boring. No one would want to get hit. Um, but I'd see Anthony Joshua stopping stopping Wilder. Um, he's too strong. 
Sasha Fury is a strong man. He's more built like a power lifter than a bodybuilder. Sometimes a bodybuilder looks power, more stronger than a power lifter, but he's not. But I think he has more strength than his Yoshi or throw him round like a ragdoll. I wouldn't see anything different. Lean on him, drag him, you know what I mean? Uh, land some punches to his chin. Doesn't have the best legs. But then again, flip the script. Anthony Joshua doesn't have a great chin and he doesn't have the heart of Tyson Fury. We've seen Tyson Fury go down again and again with concussive punches and get back up like he's the undertaker out the wrestling. Not just against um, not just against Wilder. He did it against I'm trying to remember Steve coming in, coming in. I can't remember yeah, his name. Coming in. Uh, yeah, he got knocked down. Yeah, he got, he got dropped down him. And to be honest, that was a big shot. People said it, oh, it was only he was only a cruiserweight. I don't care if he was a cruiserweight. The way he hit Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury shouldn't have got up. Every time Tyson Fury's been tested, he's got back to his feet and turned the fight on its head the same round. Anthony mm. Joshua can't, Anthony Joshua can't do it. So it, it kind of makes maybe, you know, what will happen if thingy, if Wilder's rocking, what will happen if Anthony Joshua gets knocked down. So it makes it, I think, a spectacle to watch. But all I see is probably a cagey fight and um, Anthony Joshua taking him out in a sixth. All right then. Okay, Ash. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the deal to Wilder Joshua fight doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, like Angelo said, you know, before the Fury uh, Wilder fight, you know, I mean, I'd have watched it. Is I'm I'm one of these people. Where I never pay for a boxing show. I never pay for any pay per view shows. You know, is it pointless? I'd rather gab. At five or six a.m. the next day and catch on YouTube, mm-hmm. you know, for free. Um, but I got to put my hands up. If it was before the Fury fight at Joshua Wilder, I would have paid for that pay per view. I'd have watched it and I'd have stayed up for it because that would have been a brilliant spectacle to watch. And you you wouldn't know where it was going to go. You no, know, I mean, I've, I'd, have, I'd have said that. Wilder would have knocked out um, Joshua because of that big right hand. That's what I'd have thought before the Fury fight. Um, jo- Joshua's nothing like Fury in boxing terms. He's completely different. He hasn't got the... Um, other, like, you know, Joshua is a, uh, is a tidy fighter. He's a um, um, conventional fighter. Whereas Fury... And that's right, uh, Joshua is a conventional boxer, whereas Fury is a fighter and a boxer. Now, he can, he can fight up close on the inside, he can maul you, he can manhandle you, and he can fight on the outside, he can box, he can move, he can slip, he can dip it and duck and dive. Um, you know, so Joshua can do what Fury can, and I, I, I feel that he's just too much in a straight line for Deontay Wilder's right hand. Um, but if you look at it now, Deontay Wilder must be very, very fragile mentally. And getting into a fight with somebody like Joshua with a fragile mentality is not not a safe place to be in. So it was still, it was still an interesting fight, but it's just not one that I would pay for, you know. I'd I go to bed and wake up the next day and catch you on YouTube. All right, okay. Uh, and Jeremiah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there it's it's you know basically the number two and number three guys in the world. I, I, there's some intrigue there. I mean, you know, just because they have both shown some level of fallibility, but it's it's not the fight that I want. So yes, there is some intrigue, but it, it's just not what I want to see. I mean, you know, to me, it just potentially derails plans for you know a fury fight against joshua in the future so i just i just think you stay away from it at this point you know maybe if wilder loses uh to fury in the third fight and he you know he fights a few guys here and there and keeps winning maybe he gets the loser of fury versus joshua you know i don't know but or maybe he just does something else i mean but at that point 
you know, with Fury and Joshua fighting, you've essentially solidified the division. I mean, you know who the best of the post-Klitschko era is at that point. And so it's like, where does Wilder really fit in? I, I, I don't know. I mean, he can still keep collecting paydays. He's exciting. He's a good puncher. But to me, he just doesn't fit in the bigger picture of the division right now. So, yeah, if they were to fight, I would be there would be a level of intrigue there. It's just not a path I want to go down. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I would like to still see it, but it, it depends on how Wilder comes back. Obviously, you wouldn't want to see Wilder fight Joshua next. I mean, he can't anyway because oh, Joshua's got to fight Pulev, but you wouldn't want to see him fight him uh, <clears throat> after Joshua beats or whatever to Pulev. I mean, if Joshua loses to Pulev, then it makes it even less interesting. If he beats Pulev, well, Wilder isn't going to wait, or at least, you know, he probably isn't going to wait for an entire year to fight him. And if he does wait an entire year, it would be a bit foolish to go straight into the ring with Joshua. So um, it, was, it would be interesting to see what Wilder has left in his next fight. Uh, but I also think, like many of you have already said tonight, uh, that Wilder can't be taught new tricks. And the writing has been on the wall for a while. And in this era of boxing, which isn't as bad as the Klitschko era. I mean, I think the Klitschko era was much worse. This era yeah. isn't quite as bad as that because there are some decent heavyweights out there and there are competitive fights, whereas, you know, the Klitschko era was completely dominated by two fighters, the Klitschkos, and nobody else got, you know, a look in until Fury beat um, Klitschko and then Joshua finished mm. his career. Um, so with Wilder... You know, we'll have to see what he's got left. But again, there's not that many uh, great fights out there for him. And of the ones which are left, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was surprised that he beat Luis Ortiz, to be honest. I thought that Ortiz would probably beat him. Uh, and, yeah. and like I said earlier, he has improved Wilder because years ago, he probably wouldn't be winning that fight. Um, so I think Wilder's still got some wins in him, but those wins are a bit sort of like, well... Do you really need to beat him? Because, I mean, it's not going to add anything to your resume, really. Um, so Joshua against him would be good, but we have to see what Wilder's got left. And whoever, uh, if um, Fury does fight Joshua, I think he beats Joshua, and then he'll retire. Wilder would be left without a title, without any real significant fights coming up. And Joshua, if he loses again... So he's already lost to Ruiz. If he loses to Fury, his career will be, you know, near the end. So I think in about a year and a half to two years from now, I think all three of those could be gone, um, which then means we look to the future. And I don't really want to touch on this for long, but, you know, we've got Usic, we've got Hergovic, got Joseph Parker still, and got the English lads like uh, Daniel Dubois, Joe Joyce. So, uh, you know, I think the next era will probably be about just as good as this current one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, like I said, Wilder's got some options, but, you know, they're a little bit questionable, really. Um, so does anybody want to add anything before we finish? Yeah, I want to add this. You said about the Klitschko era, and I agree with you, but if you, if you look back at the Klitschko era, they were the two giants. Genetically, they were fighting five foot eleven men, six foot David Hay, cruiserweight. Mm. David Hay wants to last a minute with half the years heavyweights now. They're mm. just too big, too strong. So I think why the Klitschko brothers had it so easy is they were fighting Samuel Peters, who if you get hit off some of Samuel Peters, you're going down. He's a big man. But they had the range. You gotta remember the reason Klitschko lost that fight against Fiore wasn't far of the time. It was he fought a bigger man with a better range. And just a, just as good enough boxing IQ as him. Mm. So the boxing IQ has increased dramatically in the heavyweight division. It's not just people trying to knock people out anymore. There's mm. something coming back, and uh, it's bringing that you know what we all love, great British, not British, great world heavyweight boxing. Not just looking at the lighter weights, watching Pacquiao. Because my concern was once Pacquiao bows out, once Mayweather bows out, what's going to happen? Because that's all I was watching. I wasn't watching heavyweights. Mm. So it's a breath of fresh air, really. Like the heavyweights are rising as these legends are bowing out in other divisions. Mm. 
Anybody yeah. else want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to add something. Actually, I I would disagree here. So th- this is where I kind of differ with you guys. I actually don't think the Klitschko era is, is that much worse than this one. The reason I say that is because I think there's more parity now than there was. But if you look at Vladimir Klitschko and Vitaly Klitschko, I would say those two are are collectively better than what we have today. And then you run through a third guy like, like Alexander Povetkin. I think Povetkin, a prime Povetkin is better than, you could say arguably better than Deontay Wilder. I actually think there's an argument um, argument to be made there that Povetkin may be better than Deontay Wilder when you examine their resumes. I mean, he beat Chigayev. You know, is Chigayev worse than Luis Ortiz? I think there's a comparison there because Chigayev was the number three guy at one point, and Klitschko is allowed to fight him for the vacant championship when, when everybody recognized him as the man, right? It's like Chigayev to Ortiz, Povetkin to Wilder, Vla- or Vitaly Klitschko to Joshua, Vladimir to Fury. I don't think there's that much of a difference. Maybe if you add in David Hay, you know, at his best in heavyweight against... I don't know, Joseph Parker or something. I I don't think there's that big of a difference anymore. And in fact, I I really haven't thought much. It's not that I don't think Deontay Sorry, uh, Jeremy. a good fighter. Yeah, can you just repeat that last sentence? You just disappeared a bit. Okay, okay. Sorry. But I, I was saying that Deontay Wilder, to me... Uh, you know he's good obviously you don't get that to that level of competition without being a good fighter regardless of his shortcomings but to me Wilder does not strike me and I, I've been on record you know for years about this is that Wilder does not strike me as being much better than guys like Michael Grant from the 90s or you know guys who were ultra talented you know real talented in the 80s like Tim Witherspoon Ray Mercer I don't think he's really that much better than guys like that. So in a, in a bygone era, I don't think Wilder is a is a real contender. So yeah. I, I don't think the era is that much better than the Klitschko's. Uh, and I, I've held that opinion for a while. I just think when you when you look at it, when you examine guy for guy, I mean, really, you know, Povetkin is way past his best now, but still competitive. You know, Parker's a good fighter. White's all right. I, I don't know. I just don't see a big gap there. Oh yeah, I should I should just uh, clear that up. When I say like worst era, yeah, that that's not what I meant. What I meant is is that we didn't get the big fights um, regularly outside of the Klitschko wins because obviously the Klitschkos were so dominant that they just beat everybody in front of them by. Much. I mean, Vladimir Klitschko didn't even drop rounds in most of his fights. Um, whereas now, outside of the top let's say two let's say let's say fury and uh, joshua are outside the you know the top two we do have interesting fights out there derek jazora against dillian white dubois against joe joyce things like that whereas like, I like i've just i've just brought up shagayev's record quickly just to remind myself and i mean his big fights were against guys like frez of um pavetkin that was obviously like a, a good fight klitschko Obviously, he's like the top guy and Valuev. So, I mean, really, his career basically boils down to a win against Valuev, a win against um, um, uh, Aquendo, and, you know, a loss to Povetkin and Klitschko. Um, and Povetkin has fought the, the lot. I mean, he's fought everybody. Um, but when you think outside of the Klitschko, of Klitschko's fights, you don't really think of that many other great fights that occurred during that era. Whereas now when you watch like the heavyweight uh, division, you do think, oh, this is, this is, this could be a good one. This one, you know, like for example, uh, Derek Chisora against Dillian White in their two fights, they were genuinely I agree. interesting thing. So th- that's what I meant when I said the era was so poor because no, the, no. the Klitschko's were I agree. so dominant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there uh, any challenges putting in it? I said, I just want to ask uh, Jeremiah or something. I, I don't know if you're saying this from a standpoint because I look at it the way Ryan said it. I think this is a better era. Now, I think Ryan's saying it a bit biased like I would because I think at the moment England has some of the best heavyweights in the world. The booming. We've got about five or six. Now, it, it used to be America. They'd have Mike Tyson. They'd have Evander Holyfield. Francis Beaufort, someone lurking, um, Morrison, they'd have someone, but now it seems like England's there. And I'm just saying, is that not part of your biased 
why you're saying you think it's a similar era to Klitschko? Uh, no, no, no. I actually I agree with Ryan's point that I think the matchmaking is better now. And if there was bias on my part, I probably wouldn't be talking about Deontay Wilder in the way that I am. And to note, I I, I do have some like ancestral affiliation with Brits, and I I have no problem at all with you know the U- the UK running the boxing scene. But I agree with Ryan's point that I think the matchmaking is better now. There's more to look forward to. All I was saying is that the talent at the top of the eras is I, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's any better than uh, it was in Klitschko area. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I think um, Klitschko, like when Klitschko was reigning, certainly towards the end of his career, I had him as my number one pound for pound fighter in the world for that reason that I just gave, which is that he never used to drop rounds. He dominated rounds much better than Mayweather did, certainly at the end of Mayweather's career. Uh, for example, when Mayweather defeated Maidana twice, he was losing rounds, and of course, you've got like the, the Mayweather mega fans who are like, oh, everything he does is, is perfect. <laughs> but when you watch those fights, you think, well, I'm sorry, but he didn't win that round, and he didn't win yeah. that round, and he didn't win we, that we round. Commentators, Ryan, I used to watch it, and they say, look at Mayweather's shoulder roll. He's making a miss. And then you'd see the free frame, and his nose was squashed. I think I'm going to see that anything, but yeah, Mayweather yeah, so- was a Towards the end, they understand what you're saying. Klitschko, yeah, so think, round by round. Yeah, so Klitschko really was head and above, uh, head and shoulders above everybody. And the way that he beat uh, Povetkin, Pulev, Hay, and barely lost rounds against any of them. Uh, yeah, so I, I think it was a great era, but we didn't get the matchmaking that we we really should have got. And um, for that reason, I prefer this era because it's just it's just got that much it's just that much more exciting really yeah i agree with that yeah i agree right, too. guys well i think that's about it we've been talking for an hour and a bit so uh <clears throat> i've got to go and make a cup of tea because uh, my throat's starting to get dry and um so thanks for taking part and um thanks everybody for listening <laughs>